Oh my goodness. So here's a life story in, in 30 seconds. Uh, first of all, the landscape architecture is, uh, I think, my soul. It's what I live and dream and my heart beats every day because of what it offers. And it started as a son of an immigrant in New York City where uh, the landscape was asphalt schoolyards, asphalt streets, stoops, concrete playgrounds, no trees. Uh, but because I joined the Boy Scouts, we got to see Central Park and Prospect Park, Bronx Botanical Garden, the beaches at the Rockaways and Coney Island and Jones Beach. And so when you have a deprivation of green of where you're living immediately, these other places became very important to me. And I recall age 11 and 12 going to Central Park and they would say, don't pick the trees, the leaves, don't pick this. And I would take my Boy Scout knife out and take little cuttings of twigs. And I still have this book of all my plant collection from age 12, 13, 14. And, uh, and at high school, I had a uh, opportunity. There were two streams in science, garden science and general science. And there was a farm close to us, the only one of two remaining farms in New York City, and my mother being an immigrant farmer with our little backyard where she grew food, uh, inspired me to take garden science. And my guidance counselor, a lady named Miss Law, said, hey, there's somebody here from the College of Forestry at Syracuse. That he'd like to meet you, or I'd like you to meet him. And by the way, dear sir, please wear a tie. I don't like seeing your underwear. I said, OK, Miss Law. Anyway, I met this fellow and decided to uh, go to Syracuse, also because they had a rowing program, and I was interested in rowing. And went to Syracuse and spent two and a half years in forestry and decided that mm, I don't want to see trees as economic value of board feet, and transferred into landscape architecture for another two and a half years. And then from there to graduate school at Harvard. And from Harvard, I won a scholarship and went to Rome to study classical history of hill towns and urban and uh, rural urban and culture integration. I was always fascinated by the Renaissance. And while I was there, I bumped into Macklin Hancock from Project Planning Associates. And I had worked in Toronto for one summer in 1961. And uh, he said, are you interested in working in Canada? I said, I'd be interested in working anywhere because I have about $5 left in my pocket after a year in, in Rome. He said, well, look, we've got the University of Guelph master plan. We've been commissioned to do that, plus implementation. I said, whoa, I never heard of the University of Guelph in my entire life. And then he said, we also have a thing called Expo 67, and we're working directly with Mayor Drapeau. I said, oh, I heard about that. He said, uh, can you come to Toronto? I said, give me an airfare and I'm there tomorrow. So that's what happened in uh, 1965. So I came to Toronto, started with project planning. And it also tied into my interest in international work. I've always wanted to experience different cultures, learn from other cultures. And I think almost from forestry background, understanding world forest communities and biomes and climatic differences and what grows where and right now I'm doing a study of oranges as a matter of fact citrus <laughs> we, we have all this import, imported citrus we don't know the origin of the orange so this is the kind of fascination I've always had with biology and of course that led to my fascination with ecology landscape ecology which is being taught at Harvard and uh, integration of ecology culture and ecology nature and culture which has been my lifelong fascination. It's Ontario Place, a place for Ontario, if you reverse the words. On landfill, began by Eb Zeidler and Mike Huff in 68, 69. And uh, that's important to realize too, because when we started the OLA in the late 60s, in 65, we only had a group of us of about seven or eight people who would meet on a regular basis, either in Dick Strong's office or Project Planning's office, and we would talk about what we're trying to do. And so Ontario Place began to evolve, and with this new commission, a parking, almost an eight-acre parking lot, 
for the administration building, was to be converted to a new park. And I have to, it has to go back to my roots in New York City because when I think of Central Park and Olmsted, and if you read his writings about what he was trying to do for uh, people with low income, mixed racial communities, we don't talk enough about that, but the black communities that existed in Central Park, uh, try and deal with health and welfare, which goes back to the English uh, philosophies and landscape and social reforms in England. I had to start to think of how Central Park became representative of, of a particular land type. The schist granite of New York City, the trees, it was an interpretation almost of the Catskill Mountains. And I said, well, here we have Lake Ontario, we have the Humber River, we have Aboriginal connections, the old Lake Iroquois issues, we have the Oak Ridges Moraine, we have the Don River, the Humber River, we have trails that came down, carrying place trail. We said, well, how do, how do we metaphorically bring this together as a place that would be visually exciting, a reflective of Aboriginal heritage, and a great learning place for people. But for, first and foremost, when you have this park, 10 minutes walk from Liberty Village, from Parkdale, 300,000 people, they can easily access this park. What does it mean for health? People living in 600 square feet, 400 square feet in Liberty Village, they're looking into the adjacent apartments. What do they come to recreate to take a deep breath, to look at the city at night, to share experiences, the bicycle ride, to rollerblade, to ski, to jog, walk the babies, walk the dog. All these became the inspiration for Trillium Park, and particularly the inspiration, the recognition of First Nations. And we work very closely with the new credit. And you'll see in the park now the moccasin identifier. Uh, I carved into one stone, walk gently on the land, the idea of stewardship when you come to the park. Think about nature, think about our landscape. It's not just all the pavement of New York City or downtown Toronto. We're walking into a green realm. You know, when you come from an immigrant family and uh, you, you sort of wonder, and I, I don't know if you've done a DNA test, I've done my DNA. So I trace my roots to Olduvai Gorge, and uh, it goes up through Turkey, through Romania, through Poland, and 80% of my genome is in Scandinavia. 20% went west to Poland and Germany, so that's my route goes back there. So I've spent many, many years on a bicycle and cars trying to trace my mother's roots. And uh, almost at the Polish border, and when she left as an immigrant at the age of 17 by herself to find a new life, you imagine this, 1927. I grew up with an environment that was very multicultural and very aware of international issues. I mean, she came just before Hitler's rise in Germany, so she knew already what was happening there. So going back though to New York City, the idea of culture and nature and how people are fused and whether it was the hunter-gatherer society or the industrial revolution and the response to pollution, you know, we don't want that kind of culture any longer, to now into the Anthropocene where we have a world dominated by, by humankind and that we'll talk about climate change. How we got to this point, and I'm currently reading about the Renaissance again, what was the, the synthesis of thinking of natural science, music, poetry, art, sculpture, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Caravaggio, Titian? You think of all these folks and what they were doing in the 16th century to create a world of humanity. Now think of today, you know, look at what's happening. Ugliness, nothing but strife, international strife. So. My own inquisitive thinking, and this is where landscape architecture is such a wonderful place to be in, because you're thinking of the world, ecozones, ecosystems, and you're thinking of cultures. Think of what's happening with water now in Cape Town. I'm working in Africa. I'm working in the Middle East. Everything is desalination. We're running out of fresh water. I'm currently working in the Arctic. 
we don't realize that one of the biggest problems in the Arctic is fresh water. It's the Arctic Ocean. And there's very little, it's, Arctic is a desert, right? So there's very little snowfall. So I'm working on rain or snow capturing systems right now. So this international aspect of work was also a personal exploration of where we are in society and where do I fit as an individual in the world today? I mean, where do I come from? Where am I going? It's a lifelong kind of weaving, a weft and warp, shaping your life to uh, explore. I think landscape architects should be explorers. I think we should be involved with expeditions, we, whether it's the Amazon or what's, the, what's happening to islands that are disappearing in the Pacific, what's happening to drought in Africa. I worked in Africa for a year, working on the new capital in Dodoma. And it was the Sahel drought. I lost 30 pounds there. We had no food. We had very little fresh water. But you saw how people were adapting to their environment and how they were trying to keep their cattle alive and keep their families alive and what foods they shifted to. And, you know, so as a landscape architect, you begin to say, well, what can I do? And in my portfolio, I see one photograph there where I started a nursery. And one of the first things we did as landscape architects was to start tree planting because the trees were being cut down for firewood. So my role as a landscape architect was to replant. And then we found out that a lot of people had eye disease, glaucoma. There was no ground cover anymore. Dust, 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 eye disease. The most impoverished people, third world people with the greatest health problems, what do we as landscape architects do? So I couldn't just sit in a studio in Toronto and I, I needed to be out in the field and work and experience and understand how other people perceive landscape, live in landscape, die in landscape, and what we can do to help health, welfare, uh, human dignity. And that, in 1967, was the founding basis for OLA, why we needed legislation, health, welfare, and public safety. Those were the pivot of why we should be a profession. It's nice to have design competitions and all this kind of thing, but if we don't get to the roots of why we are professionals, quote-unquote professionals, why are we quote-unquote explorers, why are we are quote-unquote maybe doctors dealing with health and therapy, I think we're going to miss the ball if we don't hold on to those Vitruvian, a landscape architect has Vitruvian principles here, health, welfare, public safety. Commodity, firmness, and delight, you know, you go back into history and you can marry all these kinds of things together. And this is what we do, what we do. I think there are many interesting things that are happening today that will uh, affect the way we live. I mean, climate change is very much involved with changing human behavior. And you see it in Cape Town right now. You're going from 150 gallons per person per day down to 18 gallons per person per day. So the wealthy, of course, are building their, drilling their boreholes because they have to have their lawn, right? Well, what does that do? They deplete the groundwater. Look at Phoenix. Look at so many areas of the world, India. So climate change for me says it, it deals with, I wish we had a, 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 a Musk, Elon Musk here as well dealing with the new spaceship on Mars. We have to develop the new operating principles for the spaceship Earth. The operating principles for the spaceship Earth. What keeps us going as a spaceship? We have a thin ozone, uh, oxygen layer, and atmosphere layer. We have a thin layer of soil. We have a lot of salt water, <laughs> declining fresh water, eradication of forests, conversion of land to industrial agriculture. So to me, even if I'm working on an individual residence, or if I'm working on the design of a city, or if I'm working on Trillium Park, I'm thinking, what is it going to do to help influence human behavior? Uh, what are we doing to enhance insects, wildlife, bees, songbirds particularly, raptors? What do we do that makes people aware of water as a precious commodity, more precious than gold or oil. 
And this is where it becomes interesting because people live in 600 square feet. They're, their water consumption per capita is going down. They're not living in 3,000 square foot mansions. I think there are a lot of benefits by densification in cities. And of course, there's a downside to that. Look at the value of a 600 square foot home now, 600,000, 700,000 to live in Toronto. But people are becoming more frugal. They're becoming more aware of the idea, concept of sustainability. And I think unless we can address the human behavioral issues, uh, climate change is going to get worse and worse. I think Tesla with the electric car is going to be interesting, but where do you get the lithium from? Where do you get the cobalt? How do you produce the electricity? Okay, he's going into solar. Well, what have we really done about solar in a massive way, the way the Germans... The Chinese are amazing with solar right now. I don't know if you've seen the latest, but their huge solar farm is in the shape of a panda. Now leave it to the Chinese to bring humor. This is going back to the Renaissance, delight. There's a delight in looking at the solar farm because it's a panda, the face of a panda. I love the Chinese, I think they're great. And uh, I worked in China on the design of the Beijing Embassy and I got to know a lot of Chinese people over the years and what an inquisitive, hardworking people. We have a lot to learn about what they're trying to do now to correct the excesses of the Mao revolution and the Stalinist revolution in Russia. Chinese are far advanced than the Russians. And look at the, the uh, Olympics in Pyeongchang and the Koreans did a magnificent job. And so for us, it's water conservation, harvesting rainwater, uh, reuse, reduce, recycle. This has been going on since the 1974 Club of Rome, you know, and this is not new. This was all highlighted. Uh, we have to, as a profession, embrace these principles very, very carefully, almost like a mantra, like a Torah, like a Bible, like a Koran. They should be our spiritual essence, whatever religion you look at. I thought we were the most unrecognized group of people around. And we were always secondary to architects. We were brought in to do a shrubby for a planting plan, the Coca-Cola property, a condominium. We were always bushing up something. And we were called in as subs at the lowest fee. And I always rebelled, rebelled at this. To this day, I, I hardly work unless it's my own project because I don't like to be subservient to somebody who looks down on us, the architect, the engineer. I like to be seen as an equal. I like to be seen as the profession has vision. The turning point to go to your question, I think, very much started to happen in the mid-70s. The association was growing. The School of Landscape Architecture was established at Guelph in 67, University of Toronto after that. Unfortunately, we lost the Ryerson program. That's a big hole because Ryerson to me was a great, great place. They were linking technology and architecture and landscape architecture and design. They knew how to build things, but they also had to conceptualize. I can tell you so many stories about the Ryerson people I hired over the years who had extraordinary capabilities. So by the mid-70s, you know, landscape architects were leading the development of the Meadowvale community uh, project planning. We were taking on big, big projects. Dick Strong's office had Fathom 5 Provincial Park. Uh, I was the principal designer for the Bronte Creek, the first near-urban provincial park, Bronte Creek, Project Planning Associates, I was the head designer, received the commission to master plan, build the park, which is, you can see it to this day, first urban, near-urban provincial park in Canada. The um, University of Guelph master plan, the landscape architects, all the other master plans were being led by consortiums. Uh, by Ron Tom and Trent. Here, landscape architects were leading a $250 million project, which in today's term would be $2.5 billion. And we spent from 65 to 76 on that project for all those years, coordinating landscape, urban design, engineering, architecture. So I think that was a pivotal thing. And of course, the research that was being done, snow tunnels studies, wind studies, 
uh, sociological studies. That was an important project. I think then by the late 70s, and we already were getting into our name act and all that, uh, we started to get municipalities saying you have to have a stamp. And Mississauga was one of the first communities, and that had to do with landscape architects at Eden Mills, because the toy was involved with Eden Hill, Eden Mills, landscape architects. We had project planning, had a field office in Meadowville with Stefan Bolliger, Carl Frank, and we persevered that you had to be a registered or a landscape architect had to have a stamp on drawings. Well, that was monumental and that Markham and the city of Toronto. You, you're looking at the municipal development of landscape architecture now. It started in those late 70s, early 80s. And then it continued with Michael Huff at the Ontario Place. That became a big name item. And uh, Michael published some books. And he and I were very close friends. We were neighbors and did a lot of stuff together. And I designed a garden to, as a testimonial to Michael in Trillium Park. And his family have been there now. We've sat around the rocks. All the rocks in his garden are symbolic of members of his family. So you can sit there and talk and look over the lake and the wildflowers. Nice to think of Michael. I wish we could have had him in this series. So I think, you know, look where we are now in the 90s and 2000s, how the profession has grown. And it started with that little acorn, though, back in the late 60s. If you have a desire to be engaged in society, and you look at the issues confronting us, I mean, why are we called professionals? Uh, we're dealing with, a doctor is dealing with health, right? Landscape architects are dealing with, make pretty? No. Pretty is after we've looked at health, welfare, and safety. So if we think about society today, and I think if you look at what the profession has done in Ontario, working with the Don River, working with habitat restoration, the work I did in Tommy Thompson Park, the master plan in 1986, sketching that all on a Sunday afternoon in my, my studio, we now have a nationally recognized wildlife sanctuary through design. We've taken lake fill, rubble, and shaped the landform, shaped the drainage, be aware of where the seed sources were coming from. Be aware of the prevailing winds, hot slopes, dry slopes, wet slopes, cold slopes. And then say, conservation by design, let's see what happens. At that, for 15 years, we didn't plant a thing there. We just let the seed sources come in, the birds drop their pin cherry seeds, and it evolved, a landscape that evolved. And that was also the inspiration for Trillium Park, although in there we planted a lot of trees, but that's also, it's, it is a fabric, there's a framework there to let it evolve. So I think for students today, they have the opportunity to deal with ecological regeneration, and whether it's aquatic habitat or terrestrial habitat or air, the you know, way we deal with air and wind and radiation. Uh, looking at canopy levels of cities, looking at cold water regimes to preserve trout fisheries and cold water species. That kind of ecology thinking, ecological thinking, integration of ecology and aesthetics now as well. I mean, this is the other big cutting edge right now. It's not just a mechanistic ecological imperative. You go back to the Renaissance now, we have Renaissance thinking, bringing in humanistic values, cultural values. So if you're going to go fishing, what's the environment you're going to sit in? What kind of a rock do you place? What kind of a overhang do you put out on a deck? It's all coming down to aesthetics, the aesthetics of humanity. And I think landscape architects today have so much to offer because of our background in art and science and engineering. We are integrative people. We can integrate architectural thinking. We can integrate engineering thinking. We are involved up to our top of our hip waders with mental health. 
uh, the current work I'm doing now is in prison reform and how we can bring horticultural therapy back to prison environments. And I can tell you stories about my work at the Green, Greenwood and people who haven't spoken for three years and they're in a horticultural program and this one individual, a man in his 40s, watches this bulb grow and over the weeks it flowers. And he sees a flower for the first time in years, he said, oh my gosh, I've done something of value. I created something of value. I created something. Oof. That is the kind of experience, the experiential, that we can introduce people to nature. I'll give you a story. I uh, do a lot of post, post occupancy interviews in Trillium Park. And there was one lady who came in, probably late 60s, and she was standing there as if she was lost. And I went over to her and I said, hi, what do you think of the park today? She said, I'm at home. I said, oh, I guess. what does that mean? She said, for, 60, for 35 years, I've been working in the high Arctic and I became ill and I had to leave my job. And I've been in Toronto for the last two years, living in a condominium, looking at parking lots, looking at my neighbor's windows. She said, I go to a therapist once a week. She said, I can't stand the city. She said, I came here for the first time. I smelled the trees. I see the water. I feel the sun. She said, I'm not going to a therapist anymore. I'm home. She said, I'll be here every day. And I, I see her all the time. That is the kind of landscape that we have no idea in the profession how it's affecting people. And yet it's so vital to our mandate to create humanity, conditions for humans to heal, thrive, grow, and, and, and be alive.